Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Welcome to our session, How Film Can Help Change the World. I'm so delighted that you've been able to join us to have a conversation about our film, Into Dust, directed by Orlando von Einzendel, which tells the incredible true story of Parveen Rahman and her sister, Akila Ismail, who we're so thrilled to also have with us. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right words of how to describe Parveen Rahman. She was an extraordinary woman. The film tells her true life story. She was a community advocate and a community worker. She worked tirelessly to protect the rights of Pakistan's poor. Of course, utmost among these rights was the right to water and for water justice. And her sister, Akila Ismail, continues that legacy with the Orangi pilot project. While the story is a local story based in Karachi in Pakistan, the themes resonate globally throughout the world. We'll be having a conversation about how about the film. We'll show you a trailer about the film. And um, then we'll talk about what a partnership like this, where we have a foundation, the Grunfuss Foundation, the Orangi Pilot Project, Akila Ismail, and an incredible filmmaker, what can happen when we come together to create stories around the issues that matter most? What kind of a vehicle can this be for the kind of change that we wish to see? So uh, be before anything, I'd love to get started by introducing everyone who's here. And I'll start with Orlando von Einzendel. Nice to have you with us and congratulations. The film has launched today on Amazon Prime. So I'm sure that we'll be making lots of plugs for everyone to go and watch it. And um, my colleague, Eliza Licht, will also be um, putting, uh, will be here throughout and she'll be able to connect with you and tell you more about the film. And importantly about the campaign that is going alongside with the film, which is really about how we can keep on working with our partners, all of you that are working in this space to use this film um, in a way that supports change, in a way that supports the work that you're doing on the ground. Back to my introductions, Orlando von Eisedel is the director of Academy Award winning film, White Helmets, which follows the lives of a group of Syrian civilian rescue workers in 2016. He is also the founder of two-time Academy Award-winning British film production company, Grain Media. Orlando is drawn to telling stories of humble heroism from around the world, often combining intimate personal narratives with macro-level politics, powerful visual aesthetics, and on-the-ground journalistic muckracking. Thank you for being with us, Orlando. Akila Ismail, who is also here with us, is of course, as I've mentioned, one of the main inspirations for this film. Akila is the chairperson of the Orangi Pilot Project, which is one of the world's most successful community-driven, community-led infrastructure projects in the world. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's helped hundreds of thousands of poor Pakistanis gain access to their basic and fundamental rights. Akila has a background in electrical engineering and has worked as an associate professor of electrical engineering at NED University of Engineering in Karachi. She is also an author, published both in Urdu and in English, and has written extensively on development issues throughout Pakistan. Thank you so much, Akila, for being with us. Kim Noah Skipstead is the executive director of the Grunfuss Foundation. Nice to have you and a generous supporter of the film Into Dust, the Grunfuss Foundation focuses its work on water, research, and inclusion. So that's everybody who's here. Wonderful to have everyone. Looking forward to this conversation. Orlando, we're gonna start our conversation with you. I wanted to ask you a question before we start watching the trailer for this beautiful film. What was it about Parveen's story that drew you to want to telling it? Well, th thank, thanks, Samia. Hello, everybody. Um, it's it's lovely to be here. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, I, I mean, actually, the, 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 really, this started in earnest. It, it wasn't just Paveen's story; it was also Akila's. Um, and I mean, I you know their their bravery to fight for the rights of of Karachi's most vulnerable, despite significant threats to their lives. I. I found that very in, in, inspiring, um, and you know, I, I've, I guess I've been I've been fortunate enough in my career to to try to share the stories of, of people around the world who 
you know, who, who live for something bigger than themselves. And, and I think Akila and Paveen's story and their, and their work, that, that, that epitomizes it. Um, it was also a, a story about water. And, you know, this is a precious resource that all of us rely on. I, I didn't realize quite the, the threats to, to global water supply are, you know, and how many billions of people in the coming decades are going to face severe water scarcity. And that I found that really worrying. And, and, and I suppose finally on, on, on a really personal level, I, I also lost a brother far too young in, in my life. And, and when you lose a sibling or anyone really close to you, it, it can send you in a path which is very destructive and negative, or you can use it to, to build from and try and make more positive change in, in your life. And I, I, you know, I, I could see that that's, that's exactly what Akila's done, um, and I, I, I found that very, very moving. Kim, I'd, I'd love to turn to you now and to ask you, what, why did the foundation decide to partner on this film and to tell this story about Parveen and Akila? Even though that the uh, Gunfors Foundation was based on a, on a commercial business, the Gunfors Group, uh, in business life, there are also strong values. One of them is, is for us, especially water for all, so it, it's we're, we're based on a lot of values in both Gunfors and the foundation. So it became very easy for us when we found out about this compelling story that Perina and Akila and also that Orlando, a great filmmaker, wanted to, to do this film. We could send a message for a broader audience to become activists or engage in this water discussion. Because when you talk to thought leaders, decision makers, politicians around the world, things become a bit too abstract for them. This is a story of a human being, flesh and blood, fighting for the right for all to have access to clean and safe water. And this is one of the things that we've been working for for ever since the, the company was founded back in uh, 75 years ago. So it's a compelling story, a strong message, and hopefully much more people than only politicians, scientists, activists see this. I think it's all up to... That, yeah, well, everyone in the world, that uh, it's a human basic right to have access to water, water for all of us. It's not for the few and, and the wealthy. And that fight will continue. We saw this here. We'll see that in the movie uh, from, from Karachi, Pakistan. But it's going on right now as we speak other places in the world. And one of the most, well, unsympathetic things in life is when someone gains power by preventing others to have the basic needs, and that's clean water. You've seen wars, awful conflicts in the world that causes uh, migration, poverty, and, and a genocide because of water. We want to raise the bar for uh, the agenda concerning water issues, and hopefully this movie will, will, will ignite more consciousness, but also call for action. I'm curious about why the foundation wanted to use film. What is it that film can do as a tool that some of the other work that you do, some of your advocacy work, some of your other policy work perhaps can't? Well, when, when we talk to our friends at the Water, World Water Week, we talk to politicians around the world, we talk to media, everyone acknowledges that water is an issue. Even the World Economic Forum has been concluding this for the past five to six years, that the water scarcity, access to clean water is a, one of the world's biggest problems and challenges. But it becomes a complex and kind of a, an abstract discussion. What we need to, to see for ourselves and gives us, us hope is when the, well, the so-called vulnerable join forces and become the strongest. And that's, that's needed in several places in the world, and we want to support that fight. What is your hope for this film? What do you hope that the audience members who are watching now take away from this? That we continue to explore whether we see uh, the same story from uh, as we see you here in Karachi, Pakistan. Every time we see uh, people corrupted, criminal, uh, powerful people preventing others to have safe and, and free access to clean, uh, to clean water, we should stand up for our rights. And hopefully this story will be so compelling that others, just ordinary people, uh, could engage themselves in discussing with the, at the family table or with their colleagues 
that that water issue is probably a bit bigger than we thought. We talk a lot of climate change, but the climate change discussion has a lot to do with water as well, because the water or access to water will be a challenge in the future, and we need to make sure that we share it uh, with all. Thank you. Akila, so nice to see you and have you here with us and to see your portrayal on screen. I wanted to ask you, um, you know, the, the, the film really resonates, really it's about the distribution, equal distribution of water, water justice, as you've told us many times. I'm wondering if you can share with us based on your experience and your work, um, what is it like trying to address water equity and equal distribution in Pakistan? Can you share with us some of your experiences? It's not, uh, you were talking about it is fine, but you would, when you document something and when you, when you document something that exists on the ground, which means Kate, you have put together where the water is being, uh, where, where people's right to water is being used. I mean, this water belongs to everyone who lives on the planet, on this earth. And there were certain sections of people who don't have power, who are poor, who are being deprived. And this is something that uh, uh, Parveen could not tolerate because her whole work, her whole life, by the way, we are also immigrants uh, of war. I mean, we were also thrown out and dispossessed from our land of birth. And we know the value of, of, uh, of human life. And uh, she, the, the place in which she, she set up her office or her office was set up is a place which is water deficit. And why is it water deficit? When you, they, she went around researching, okay, what is it where she lives, which was in a middle, a middle income area, she gets water. Why is it that Orangi, where she works, and the poor live, they do not get water. They get water maybe once a month and they have to wait up and they have to go and beg for water. Why? So when she started doing this research, uh, they, she discovered that there was, for Karachi I'm talking about, there was no lack of water. It was being given the amount that it should be given. But 30% of Karachi was absolutely deprived of water. And the other 30% was getting water sporadically, like, like Orangi. Now, because we had already mobilized public, uh, I mean, people awareness and around sanitation, the next thing that needed to be done was water. And from the very beginning, uh, water was a very important part of the program uh, of how to achieve, how to get water at low cost. For example, laying the lines, etc. But with the problem with water as against the problem with sanitation was that what the resource is controlled by the government. The, res the water resource is controlled by the government. So, why is the government not giving equal water or equal distribution of water to everyone? And you cannot say that they are poor, so they cannot pay taxes. They're willing to pay whatever needs to be paid. There is, there is absolutely no question of that. You know, they don't want anything for free. They just want what is theirs. And why is it that the government cannot provide them free water? So as citizens, they deserve it, even if they are not citizens, they're human beings. Their animals deserve water, their trees deserve water, their food deserves to be grown with water. So, you know, with all this in mind, when she started documenting, uh, actually documenting the fact that where was the water going, it was discovered that the water was again, there was enough water coming in. At that time, there were 650 a uh, million gallons per day being supplied to Karachi, but, and 610 millions were being used, you know, but even if, it, that means it was getting water in excess of what it needs, but yet these poor people, the poor settlements were not getting water. So it transpired that they were being stolen from the bulk and they were not being stolen from little pipes, they were being stolen from the bulk and they were being stolen in connivance with, with, with certain government agencies who control water. And of course, the police has to be involved. The local thugs have to be involved. Everybody was given access. In fact, the person who we say has 
is the principal accused in our case. He had a water hydrant himself. So why is he going to have Parveen, this, this, like, this girl, you know? And the fact that she was a woman was also playing into this, how can she challenge us? Challenge the fact that we, we, can, do, we can take water what is, uh, and we can sell it. And they were selling it to industrial consumers. And this was a huge empire, totally supported by the politicians, and, and Parveen was able to quantify it. Okay, where was water stolen from? How much was being stolen? And there these points of, uh, uh, of, uh, of water stealing were located. And, and they were located in police stations, in the vicinity of police stations, in, in schools even, in government, uh, you know, in the compounds of government agencies. So, uh, so you know, she documented it to such an extent that it became irrefutable. And she took her two years or more to do this. And all the while, uh, she was being warned. She was being warned by people, okay, why are you doing this? You know, don't do this. But you know, she, she didn't, she thought that nobody knows her. She's just documenting. She's this girl who goes around with a dupatta on her head, who's going to notice her, etc. Then when this report was published, she published it, uh, incidentally, the first person to write about it is, was from Dawn. And then it came, it, then it was broadcast on television. Then, of course, it became a big threat. But on the other hand, Parveen was supremely happy that it also led to the government taking action because it was a great big, big embarrassment for them. Okay, they were making water off a natural resource, which is the people's right to get. It's not just the people's right, it is nature's right. It is, it is something which nature has given you and you have to give it back to them. So um, uh, the, the, the situation eased. You know, the situation eased day by day by day. When hydrants were, were, were uh, closed down, the illegal hydrants were closed down. So that water which was being stolen started getting into the pipes. But of course, uh, this was not really taken very lightly. Okay, look at this organization. Look at this woman running an organization. How dare she challenge us? How dare she? This was the thing, you know. And um, although the situation uh, became, is also a person who, who is complicit in this. So it is not, it's not difficult to draw the conclusion that uh, it was water that killed her. This is what the police told us right in the beginning. That and, and it's question and this is asked all the time. Why did she do it? Why didn't she just live a comfortable life? You know, as many others do, like I did, for example. I used to tell her don't do it. But uh, she was driven. She was driven by the fact that there has to be equity. There has to be justice. This was her. This was what she lived for. And you know, I, I, I think I said this to Orlando as well, that you know, there, is, there was a little uh, plaque near her bed. And you know what it said? It said, okay, there is a place for all that they're not taking the You cannot just exclude people. You cannot just exclude nature. You have to bring all of humanity and all of nature into your, uh, into your planning. And uh, therefore, she was, uh, it never entered her mind, you know, that this could be a source of danger for her. Although there were people warning, including me, you know, warning her. And then, you know what she did? After she exposed this, she went on and began to document land. Because land is gold. And, you know, with so much, uh, the war economy, the drug economy, etc., cetera, which, which was centered around Karachi because it is a port city, it is, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, you know, very, uh, it has access to the whole of the Khyber Pakhtunka, etc. So she started to document land because the water that were, the, 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 sorry, the, the money that was being made from the drug trade, from the war economy, the Khan war economy, where uh, the, the transit trade was taking place, where the NATO trucks used to pass from the, uh, to, from the port to supply arms to supply food, et cetera, to the troops in Afghanistan. 
so you know it 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 and the land became so valuable because these trucks were then uh, hijacked and sold so there was so much money around and where does the money go the money would go to land and she started documenting that and then that came into the people's into these these i want to call them a bad abuse but i'm not going to do that uh, these monsters they said you know what did you look at what she did with water it was an explosion i mean she stopped us and of course it didn't stop uh, uh, all of it was not stopped but it was it was dented they said if this gets done then we are we are going to be the biggest uh, losers so one evening uh, as she left the office 10 minutes she didn't even go beyond uh, maybe a few maybe half a kilometer and this is not shorter and uh, and the next day what they did was they came on television the highest police officer in in uh, karachi came on television and said okay look 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 this was done by this this so and so person he named a person and we have killed him so we solved the uh, so they were covering up of course we were not interested it took us a few months to get, get, get come to grips i mean it took me a, a lot of time to come to grips with the situation because my first reaction was that you know i should just take my mother and leave this city is so cruel she lived for this city she lived for this country and it took her life but then i saw the hundreds and thousands of people mourned for her who came into our house they were just they just came to sit we were being used to live and then I, it dawned on me you know that you know she lived for justice she would have she would have given her life for justice for any one of us so we cannot let it go that's when we started you know our uh, quest for justice and we looked at many venues and the thing we decided was that going through the legal process was extremely important because it was very of course it was important to go through the media etc but going through the legal process was the only thing that would get these people punished and of course there also we were told that look uh, you know life and death is a part death is a part of life and they keep telling us this death is a part of life of course it's a part of life everybody who's born is going to die but everybody who's born is not going to get killed how are we going to accept this so we started our quest we went into the and we went straight to the supreme court which never which never takes up any case uh, which is of single murder because it's the highest court of appeal but to our surprise and to uh, you know the justices immediately accepted our uh, our uh, petition and for 7 years you know that the supreme court is not a court of investigation it can only you know formulate uh, certain bodies to do investigations so there was the first the first thing we wanted was that the, that this court should make known that the person that was killed did not kill pardeep you know therefore the the case has to be opened and we said that that man also deserves justice he cannot be killed in the name of god you can't do that so we were able to do all that and we moved through the courts there was joint investigation teams formed the first one the second one so while the police there were many police officers who were very very sympathetic with us in fact one of them is going to come to our uh, panel that day for the 30th she they 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 said ke hey, you know we are with you but what can we do there is so much pressure on us so much pressure on us uh, that so we figured that there is a huge cover up taking place here and we persisted when the then in the end uh, what happened was and you know it was surprising to the police that the justices were were with us in fact the justices used to say ke hey, you are not talking about you know he actually said that they said ke hey, you are not talking about an ordinary person you are you're talking about parveen rahman you know so they used to say that and then um uh, from that girl parveen rahman right yeah that girl yeah yeah they used to call her that girl uh, wo ladki you know too uh, and uh, that you know it kept us going and we were never never disappointed by the courts and never disappointed by the system because the the, the police there was there was a large section of the police which also helped us otherwise we could never have got come this far they used to help us in a very 
covert manner, but they did. Without them, we could not have gotten these five people in jail. So the uh, uh, anti uh, uh, anti terrorism court is trying them on uh, on uh, the twenty eighth is the final uh, hearing, yeah. the closing arguments, and we hope a verdict will come in which some justice will be served. We are absolutely certain justice will be served, and uh, so you know yeah. we hopeful. Yeah. Of course, it it won't bring Parveen back, but it will make. You know, it will validate our lives. It will validate us. Of course, of course, and what and a you wonderful know, she, uh, tribute it, to someone as well to, to it, be. It will validate that. us, and it validates everyone who supports us. So that is what we need. Justice. Yes. So justice for Parveen Girman means justice for humanity. Thank you, Akila. And yes. Absolutely. And, you know, the, Parveen Rahman's murder was it definitely, you know, in the trailer, it says it shocked the nation. But Orlando, I've heard you say in the past that you were you were surprised that this was not a story that was on the global stage. And it was something that really moved you to tell it. And I think from all of us just hearing from Akila now and hearing the story uh, of Parveen as well and everything that happened, we can kind of understand why you would be drawn to be creating this film, why this film could have so much purpose and power. And I wonder, Orlando, if you could share with us any other experiences you've had that would affirm for you that film can be beyond entertainment. It can be beyond documentation and it can have an impact. Can you, can you share some of your experience with us, please? Sure. Um, so I, I, you know, the, the, the list. I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. The, the little I know about about social change, driving social change, is is, is film is is one tool in a whole toolkit. Um, but it, it can be a very useful tool. And and you know, yes, film is. It's not such. It's not a niche sort of medium. It's a mass appeal medium. It can appeal to you know teenagers and it can appeal to academic professors so it has this potential for, for mass appeal it's also it can be a tool which galvanizes different people from all from all walks of life you know this film has galvanized a community-led organization in Karachi it's it's brought together a foundation based in Denmark a filmmaker everyone on this panel today so it, it's it's really great at, at bringing people together. And, and then I, you know, I think as, as, as a storyteller, one of the, the most interesting things that, that, that I think film does is it can act as an, as an empathy bridge. It can, it can have somebody watching in Los Angeles and it can be learning about somebody's life on another part of the world and it can bring them together and break down all these boundaries and prejudices and misunderstandings. And I, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a little example. Um, we made this, this film that you mentioned at the beginning called The White Helmets about Syrian rescue workers. And we had this Google alert on the film when you know media was published and we get an email saying this has just been published. And one day uh, uh, an alert came up and it was a podcast from the Midwest of the United States. And it was two teenagers who had their own film podcast and they'd watched the film on Netflix. They mostly watched movies, not really documentaries. And they watched this film they knew absolutely nothing about Syria. They, they didn't even know how to pronounce the word, you know, the word Syria, but they were talking about the film. And what was extraordinary is, is they were saying, oh, wow, you know, the, the, the guys in this film, they're, they, they're just like us. They have hopes and dreams just like us. Now, you know, everyone on this panel, that might be really obvious, but, but, it, but it's not always obvious, especially if you've grown up thinking that, you know, people in Syria with, with, with beards who are religious are, are people to be afraid of. That, that was quite extraordinary. Um, but it's also, you know, to, to, for, for films to, to drive social change, it, empathy is not enough. You also have to, um, you know, you have to uncover, I guess, the foundations of a, of a problem within the film. You have to go beyond just empathy. And it's that nexus, I think, when you have, when you create empathy with an audience and you sort of elucidate the problems that the people in the film are experiencing, when you then your audience cares, they've learned something, they've learned about the problems, they deeply care about these people on screen. And then if there's an ask at the end of the film, it actually can make it's much more likely that they might go and do something. And then yes, you have to work really hard with the film to you know to screen it to potential particular audiences and all of that other stuff. But but when it when it all works and you work really hard, film can be a really great tool for driving social change. 
And I just want to mention with that, that, you know, we have this film, we hope that when you watch this film, you're incredibly moved, but there's many ways that you can take action. And when you're looking in the chats, you'll see links that will be coming up when we have our discussion of how you can learn more about the campaign that we're running, the partners that we're working with, the, the screenings that we hope to do. And we, you know, anyone in the audience can also host a screening and we have discussion guides available. So there is, the film itself, which can move you, but as I'm hearing Orlando say, and that I can validate is that there's an organized effort then to help people to move them towards action. So Kim, this brings me to, um, you know, something that Orlando already um, elucidated, which is around collaboration. What are some of the opportunities that you can share with the audience who's here today about the greatest opportunities for success that might exist between these different audiences? We have philanthropists, we have policymakers, filmmakers, storytellers. Please share with us about your experience and what you might hope for. Well, I think it's, it has a lot to do with exactly what we've seen, what you're going to, about to see in the movies that uh, don't tell it, show it. Uh, use the examples, the one here from Karachi, I have several examples from around the world where people stand up for their rights and suddenly become the strongest uh, in the discussion or in the potential conflict. And, and, and the funny thing is, uh, Orlando was touching upon this, it's, it's amazing to see that uh, we're in Pakistan, we're in Denmark, and, and even though that Karachi is a long way from Denmark, and here in Denmark we don't have these issues at all, but still it's it's a universal issue because if there's not water for all or we have these uh, water conflicts, it affects all of us, even though I live in a very uh, quiet and friendly place with a lot of uh, ground water and it's, it's available for, for all. We need to engage ourselves. We need to be more passionate about especially natural resources. And, and we are seeing a movement when it comes to climate change, we see the movement young, among young people that they ask when they apply for a job, they engage in society, they have strong demands for uh, the, the people in power that they have, have to ask a lot, uh, answer a lot of questions, whether their values are okay, to document how they do it, more transparency. And I think that's a good thing for the world. Uh, I would love to see it in all corners of the world. And that's what the foundation that I represent is trying to do uh, because then we can engage with an organization like the Orangi Pilot Project. We can engage with other NGOs. We can engage with governments, provinces, local authorities, but also uh, the media world, in, in this case, Orlando, uh, that in, so he can tell the stories in a much more compelling way and much more passionate with empathy than we can do. So I think it's the future uh, for social change, also political change and transparency and community engagement has to be the partnership between individuals, groups that usually do not have the dialogue, but can meet with the same values and, uh, and prospects. And this is one of them. And I think this is, is also, well, it's, it's, it's very insightful for us in the foundation because we've never went into movies, we never supported a project like this, but, but we hope that they'll broaden uh, much more out and, and we'll see others engage in, in the same course as, as we've been engaged in for now 75 years. I'd love to now ask everyone who's um, watching, who's listening to throw some questions into the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, and of course, um, I'll keep asking questions until we get some. Akila, let me ask you, um, after having had the experience of, um, you know, having this film made about you and about um, your sister and going through everything that you're going through now, what is your hope for the film and, and what the film can do as you continue to fight for justice, both for Parveen, but also through your work with the Orangi Pilot Project, fighting for justice for so many low-income Pakistanis? Um, you know, if we had not uh, uh, embarked on the journey for justice, I don't think we could, none of us could have survived. I could not have. Neither could have been, neither could a Rangi Pilot Project do that. So, you know, we want the, the, the whole message of, of 
optimism in book that Perrine projected. Her, her thing was that there is a lot of abuse, there's a lot of injustice in the world, but there are people who are trying to do the good thing, you know, people who are trying to make lives better for themselves. It is these people who we have to look at respectively, learn from them, and then, and then possibly teach them to do it in a very pro professional way. Because Parveen, I mean, she was a community activist, but we must also remember that she was a brilliant architect. She was, she was a architect who, who wanted to build communities, not houses, but communities. So this is also very important. The, the film also touches upon this, that the first of all, this is a woman and uh, who's taken on the world or who's taken on the mafia, as we say. And then she never lost hope at any time. You see, this is the message that there is always hope, but you have to strive to, to make, to get to it. You know, you, you must create the information base. You must create the knowledge base for this. And we always, and we continue to believe that in order to get any kind of justice or any kind of development, you have to go from the lane to the city. You cannot, you know, to the global. So what has happened is can we manage the lane and we manage the city and we manage the, the country, but Orlando made it global. So let us hope that the ethos that Orangi uh, pilot project worked on and Parveen worked, worked on and we, we are still trying to keep it going will resonate because this is the only way in which you can you can uh, create development for the poor for the low income settlements and that is through uh, creating a, a means uh, a partnership between the people and the government and how do you create that you create that by creating the the knowledge base so and you know this this is something that we wanted uh, 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 from the very beginning, when we started talking to Harry and Orlando, this is always the 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 hope that the 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 ethos, the process, the the aesthetics, the ethics, the the uh, that we that OPP and uh, and Parine has engendered, that should be made global, you know. And I think that the film touches upon this, and and the film is going to create more and more interest in this process. So, you know, this is what is so important that we believe that the, that all development must be start from the lane, from the, from the, the, I mean, our unit of organization is the lane with 20 houses, each house with seven people. So, you know, and from there you go to the city, then you go there. So this is something that we, she believed in, we believe in, and, and, and Parine was very successful in creating her models. So, the models must now, and I'm not saying that you have to exactly follow this, but you can adapt it yeah. to your to your yeah. situation. In fact, uh, there was a regional development network that was uh, that was created by Parveen and her friends in Nepal, in India, in uh, Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, which was called the regional development network, and they had all begun uh, to to you know come together on understanding how OPP began. OPP's development philosophy, and yeah. it was it, it was just beginning to take off when the read was filled, and I have not been able to bring it back together. Yeah. I hope to someday, but I think the work has been made easier with this film. That's because yeah. you know then you don't have to tell them, give them statistics, or give them the, your reports. You just have to show them the film. Yeah, and you can just uh, make the message known from every lane towards yeah. the city. That's a, that's a great one. So I have a couple yes. of questions that are coming in that I'd love to read. This first one, I believe, is probably for Orlando from uh, Rika Srivastava. Considering the actual story of Parveen, were there any similar challenges while making this film? Um, thank, thank you for, for the question. Well, well I, you know, I... I I guess a significant one was the fact that not all of the film was filmed in Karachi for for, for, for safety reasons. And you know, I, I, I wish I wish that hadn't been the case. You know, when when me and Akila and the rest of the team started talking about this at the beginning, it, it, it looked like that was what we'd be able to do. Um, it turns out we couldn't. So you know, some of the film was shot in in India, 
Um, and then a smaller, there was a much, a much smaller team. We spent time in Karachi at the end, but but yes, a big part of it was shot there for for the same security problems that that you know sadly played Paveen and 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 Akita's life today. Right, and I think it's important to note that you know one of the uh, big concerns was really about, of course, your cast and crew safety, but also really about Akila and Seher and everyone in the family safety as well, uh, keeping everyone safe. I wonder if I can follow up Orlando, since we've had this conversation before with, um, you, you know, I think you got the highest praise from uh, Dawn saying that you captured Karachi authentically. If you can um, elaborate a little bit on how you were able to maintain um, the nuance of the Urdu language and uh, some of the sites from Karachi and uh, many of the ways that you were able to do that. Well, I, I, I just, I mean, frankly, very simply, it's, it's Akila, Paveen's friends and family, their generosity to spend a lot of time talking to us. And, you know, we, we tried to be as far as possible sponges to absorb all that knowledge and, and that sharing and try to put that as much as possible in, into the film. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big responsibility to, to, to document and represent anywhere that's not, you know, your immediate experience in life. Um, and, um, you know, it, it was amazing that, that Dawn, the newspaper felt that we had done that. And, but I can only put that down to, to everybody that was generous to give us that information and share their experience with us. Another question, and this question is coming in from Mali Lono Batura. Such a powerful story that illustrates the fragility of nature, including human nature. For those interested in mobilizing change, what are your thoughts on infighting within communities that all seek the same thing, resources for their community, but immobilize their initiative because they can't agree on how to get there? I wonder um, if, if Kim and Akila have seen um, this in their work where communities all want to get towards the same goal, but because of infighting within the community or differences of opinion, they have trouble mobilizing to get there. Well, uh, I've, I've seen it with my, my own eyes in, in, uh, in uh, which was changed into a, a good story in, uh, in a refugee community in uh, in the western part of Tanzania, uh, people, uh, refugees from Congo and Burundi were living in the, in the refugee community and, and of course discussing and sometimes uh, arguing uh, who had, uh, had more rights to get uh, access to water. And that water was an issue in, in this refugee community and, and it's a refugee community we never talk about. Uh, we usually know about the refugee communities around the world where the problems are, but this one has been somehow also among uh, thought leaders and politicians forgotten. Uh, and and uh, what we did, and, and it's not it's not our fault, but it's 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 a story that really changed my view on that things can be done if we uh, discuss and have a dialogue on what can water do for all of us instead of just half of us, uh, and and especially not struggling to who, who's going to have the water uh, and who's not going to have the water. And in this refugee community, the water was uh, heavily polluted uh, by uh, the nearby river and where they used uh, diesel generators to, to supply the people there with water. And it was, uh, well, it was polluted. It was not good. But we went in there together with several NGOs and also UN, UN bodies and found water on the underground and, and got it up. And suddenly there was plenty of water. And suddenly children were blooming because they were not sick anymore. The Burundis and Congolese took on a mutual uh, responsibility to make sure that the water system was working because it was based on solar. So they had to clean the solar panels every day. So it was uh, the most efficient as, as possible. And the Tanzanian uh, government and authorities saw that this was working. So they could, well, put a cross in a thick, thick box then saying that, this water issue is not an issue. That's, that's not a conflict anymore. But agreeing on how to use the water system, how to distribute it, became suddenly the subject of other 
matters also. Where when they started talking about schools, they started about talking about sanitation, hygiene, and so on. And suddenly they found out that the dialogue was benefiting all, instead of a conflict, probably only benefiting half of them. So, so the idea of or the notion of that if if we can provide uh, the tools, the perspectives where it can benefit the most people as possible. I think there's a, there's a base there for dialogue and that's very important. Akila, I wonder if you have any um, stories to share given that so much of Orangi pilot projects work centers people who are um, often on the margins, centers them in leading this work, um, you know, you can share with us any of your experiences or, or what you would hope that people would understand about your work while trying to achieve water justice and what it means to have people who are the most marginalized lead the work. You know, for us, it is not difficult now. It was very difficult when Praveen started because now we have a demonstration of what can, what can happen. And the main thing is that we have brought, we have given people a seat at the table to dialogue with the, with the uh, local government, with the chairmen, with the, with the members of parliament, etc. So they, which they never had. And how did we do that? We did that by, by giving them knowledge of what they, uh, you know, what they could do and the power. And you know, this thing began, it took, the first lane was built, uh, it took them two or three years to do this of continuous talking, continuous mobilizing. But you know, Parveen and OPP never went to the people saying, okay, look, this is the solution and this is what you have to do. No, they said, look, what is it that you really want? How have you been doing it? And you know, they would show how, she said, okay, we do it this way, is it better? You know, so it was more a dialogue of, of working towards a solution based on what these people had already done, you know? so. By, by giving them the respect that what you have done is not wrong. But if you had done it this way, it would be better. And it took several years. And it also took a low cost uh, models, the low cost sanitation model, the low cost water uh, distribution model, low cost housing model, because then it's low cost. And we told them, okay, look, it's your money, you, you invest. Once you invest, you become a, you become a, uh, somebody that the government is going to listen to because you've already invested. You're not freeloaders, you know? And of course, you must remember that it is the power of women because the first lane manager was a woman. She was a middle, uh, middle-aged woman who's, who uh, when these people were quibbling and talking about it's too much money, we can't do this and that. And, and you know, she put her foot down and she said, you guys go off to work we are the ones left in this film and in this environment, and you better cough up the money. Because it was usually on money, you know, you have to collect money from each household, and then somebody has to become uh, responsible for, for paying the mason, for paying the, the pipe of the person who delivers the pipe. And it was the woman who did it, a woman who did it. And you know, she just recently passed away. Okay. And I think just before Orlando, you came and you met those ladies, she had just passed away. So, you know, it was women and, and, and it is the women who suffer the most when there is no water, when there is, the environment is dirty. So they are the ones who are in the forefront of OPP's uh, implementation, even now when we go into newer areas. And it, it has to be, they have to, make, they have to understand that they are the ones who are doing the, who are making the, uh, making it right, who are creating the solution. It's not, we are not telling them what you need. You're telling us, okay, look, we, we want to do this. We're doing it this way now. It's not working out now. You know, you're professionals, you tell us. And then we gently, you know, move them towards that. So one of the biggest things about mobilizing is that you don't put the other person down. You listen to all points of view. And you, you, you then gently move them to, okay, now look, if you look at it, this. Now, you know, dialoguing takes, uh, it's very difficult. It's not easy. I mean, putting up a mega project is so easy. As Parveen would say, instead of mega project, you need mega management. Putting up a mega project is so easy. You just get in money from the international financial institutions 
you make something on the drawing board and you put it on the ground and half the time it doesn't work there have been huge disasters it is very difficult when you have to talk to talk to people dialogue with them constantly constantly in a very gentle manner with respect you have to respect them and that is the only way and of course women leaders lead the way i think yeah. Pareen led the way and our lane managers are women. many lane managers not all yeah so they become then the the uh, the uh, leaders who then you know take it to others like this woman who had her relatives living in another lane that the, that lane people came to us and said okay you know do this for us now for us working in orangi is we, we don't we don't they just come to us we get them the design we you know do whatever it's not from one lane it is now seven thousand lanes from 0.8 million people there are 2.3 million people but we work outside karachi as well huh? We work right. in Samava, we work in Punjab, we work in APK, etc. But our method is the same. It's dialoguing. Right. It's it's talking to people. We don't share data. We don't share designs. You know, we tell yeah. them that you mobilize around this, and we will help you in creating the most uh, optimum design. And you late. We are not going to give you money or take money from. You. Great. You know, there's so much. There's so much that we could learn from from OPP and from the story, and that's why we hope that. So many of you go on to watch it. We're just about at time. So I wanted to leave everyone. I, I can, I, I always hate when I have to follow Akila because she always um, puts everything so well. And then you're right after that, it comes down to me. <laughs> but I'll leave you all with just one question, which is um, what would be one message that you hope that people could take away from the film? Orlando, let me start with you as the filmmaker. Well, it's very it's very hard to do to do one. I and I, you know, we 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 really hope that the film can support Pavine's legacy and Akila's work and the work of the IPP. Um, and, and of course, we hope it sparks a, a conversation about water. Um, I, I, but I'm going to build on something that Akila said. I, you know, I, the world right now is is a very gloomy place. There are a lot of human made crises, and and you can just turn on the news and it can be very depressing, and you can lose hope and you can lose faith. In, in humanity a little bit, I, at least I find. And I, I guess I hope people watching this, I think, you know, it, it, and it's strange to say this because you're there, Akila, but your your life, your work, and, and that of Vivian, your sister, is, it's it's the kind of work and dedication and, and sacrifice, frankly, that, that gives me, continues giving me hope in, in people and, and what the world could be. Um, and so that's that's what I'd like to say, thank you. Kim, what would be yeah, one? <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's very it's, it's a tough question, but but hopefully uh, that uh, awareness and attention to uh, this topic uh, can uh, somehow also uh, bring change along. I think it's a it's a question, and I think uh, I think the the movie says it so well that it's it's vital that uh, people organize and mobilize and and have a dialogue in order to fight for their rights and, and point at, at the injustice uh, and, and bring in the media, bring in other people so that uh, you can become stronger. That's, that's the way of life for, for decades, uh, or for, well, the, the story of mankind, but the struggle continues. It's not over yet and, and keep on fighting. If you see injustice, uh, raise your voice. Akila, anything you'd like to leave us with that you hope this film yeah. might? I mean, you know, there, there, there is a lot of, lot of uh, uh, injustice and abuse and horrors in this world. The, yes, there is all that. But there are also people who are so worthy of our respect. And therefore, there is, since that, there is a lot of concern. There is a need to be concerned. But there's no need to be despondent. You know, and I always like to talk about Parveen's eternal optimism by through one phrase, and that was that remember the arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends towards justice. She's proven it. She's proven it. We are going to get justice. She got justice. So, you know, that is what we have to keep on. Uh, you know, we can't give up, and there is no need to give up. There's no need to be disappointed. 
Thank you so much. What wonderful words to leave us with. There's always reason for hope. Thank you to every, thank you to all our wonderful panelists for this engaging conversation. Thank you to everyone uh, who's come to listen. Please go out and watch the movie Into Dust on Amazon Prime just launched today. Please visit our website intodustmovie.com. Please follow us on social also Into Dust Movie 1. Um, we'll have everything in the chats for you and um, thank you so much. <laughs>